And now, only on KGRA Radio, this is the Starborn Connection. Greetings, everyone, fellow Earthlings and all you extraterrestrial and interdimensional beings out there who faithfully listen in. I know you're there. You have made the Starborn Connection again this week, and you are all welcome to come on in. Our virtual studio is docked here at KGRA, our home, and what a home. We are number one on the Internet for UFO and paranormal radio. Uh, We have a, a great show for you tonight. Uh, I have some information uh, from uh, Oli, uh, some new information, a September 10th uh, visitation or reading by Ivana Podraska. And uh, then we're going to have our old friend Tom Reed on. Uh, He's going to be joined later by Sean Payne Stowe. Uh, Tom Reed is unique in the fact that his family, uh, he and his family are, are the only family people in the nation maybe even the world who has an official monument dedicated to their sightings and a park surrounding it just an amazing thing and and we'll get into you know the the sighting and everything go all the way back to 66 when it first happened and we'll bring you all up to date uh hello julia how you doing my (laughs) co-host I'm doing great. High vibrations tonight. <laughs> oh, good. Fantastic. Hey, nothing like high vibrations. <laughs> and Bill, how are you, my producer? Doing great. And hello to Michael, Julia, and Tom. And I just want to say a quick word to all those that may be under the effects of Hurricane Nate. Please be safe and stay Absolutely. hunkered down and stay indoors. And we're all praying for you. Absolutely. And we're also praying for the families of the victims of the Las Vegas massacre out there. Just just uh, it just something straight from hell. We don't want to deal with it, but we have to. Uh, you guys are all in our prayers. Yeah, I'm going to uh, at my at 1130 when I get on to talk about Ascension, I'm going to I wrote something in advance um, about that incident and how to get past that. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, I will start <clears throat> with, uh, pardon me, um, Oli's new information. Now, uh, the extraterrestrial biological entity, Oli, uh, the transmission comes by means of spiritism, which utilizes a communication device that resembles a Ouija board. The medium is Ivana Podraska. The interpreter is her sister, Ilona. Um, Oli is an extraterrestrial being and an interdimensional being that hails from the 12th dimension, from a planet in the 12th dimension. For 24 years, the sisters have been in communication with uh, Oli, and in that time they have gathered hundreds of pages of information. Um, I consider myself a student in this field, even though this year marks the, my 14th or 15th year, I can't remember, of researching and working in this particular quest to answer those eternal questions. Are we alone in the universe? And are we being visited by beings from other worlds or dimensions? My opinion is that we are not alone, and yes, they're here. Now, the interp- this particular interpretation, I have to make it clear because I'm getting feedback from um, other sources out there that um, I are either uh, critiquing or criticizing, I'm not really sure, uh, my interpretation of the information based on what uh, Ilona gives me. So this interpretation from Oli is my interpretation based on the information given to me by Ilona and mine alone. I take responsibility for its contents, editing, and dissemination. I am aware that this this information can be in, uh, interpreted differently by someone else and in many other ways. This represents only one of those ways. Now, Oli opens up the transmission in the usual way by exclaiming the Alleluia and the two O's, two letter O's. Across the earth, he says, there is a big disaster coming together. 
he tells us that there is much danger, quote unquote, in the air. He states that we should be interested in a powerful identity, but does not give any clues as to whom it might be. He says again to the sisters that the government knows about them and that there is, is still chaos in the underground. Now, based on the information describing the government in the past, I interpret this as being our, our government and our underground installations. Uh, Ali points out that there are more or other extraterrestrial units, and I'm wondering if he means ships out there, but they are just guessing or speculating about what is happening on, under, or around the Earth. It's not quite clear, but that represents the three possible locations. Um, Oli warned again about watching people over the computer. The computer must be a very, very dangerous piece of equipment because, uh, you know, this is valid when you consider the millions of personal accounts that have been hacked into so easily. And do we really know the source of, of, of these disruptions, these break-ins? We don't know. They could be blaming the Russians. Who knows? Um, Oli points out, that they, all these people, are not obliged to take questions and give answers. I guess they were getting a little annoyed. Uh, he notes that communication occurs only through Ivana. Oli indicates that they do not like interference with the communication because it loses its power. And I wonder if he's talking about all of us who are trying to interpret or spread the meaning here. Um, perhaps none of us are getting it right, and, and I'm sure he'll let us know. Um, he reassures us that Ivana is not a fake. She is a real medium, and there are people around them, quote-unquote, around their house or around the world that hate them and do not like them. That's very, very interesting. Oli then says he and his brothers missed their task in the atmosphere, and I'm not sure what that means. So instead, they focused on Ivana and tracking the people around her. Oli says that their behavior toward Ivana indicates that Ivana is somehow endangered and they are keeping an eye on things. Then he mentions the Earth's weak energy. And, and I'll let you, my audience, juggle that piece around and see where it fits in because I do not know. Um, Oli tells us that underground leaders are dealing with the degradation in the rocks from which their underground shelters are made. And there are parts of the government in different areas of America and other places that want to destroy, destroy these underground places and life underneath the earth. Oli reminds us that the energy weakness in our atmosphere has weakened the functionality of their ship. Uh, then it gets really weird, and, and this particular section is very difficult to understand. And I'm going to give you the uh, exact translation from Czech, and maybe, maybe one of you people out there that have a sharper mind than I do at this time of night uh, might put something together with it. Um, here it is. It is not all that the human structure would like. Strength is weakened in America Asia, Europe. There is a bias in part of the propaganda system of her lab's side. The disaster is mine. It is eroded by the Space Corps pressure in the winding program. America as a whole is losing in the program. Wow, it really sounds ominous, and I'd like, I'd like to know more about what America is losing and how they are doing it. Uh, I could maybe take a few guesses. Now, in this section, Oli gets a bit ethereal. He starts out with a cryptic reference. The interpretation reads, its deflection point is at 78. That is the KOD coding component in the country assembly database. Now, it gets easier to understand. All HARP is not managed by your processes. It is also governed by the judgment of the universe. Very interesting. It is a process that became uh, known even in the Old Testament or before the Old Testament. I'm not really sure where that time point is. 
uh, he says there will be floods. Now, whether that's a historical reference or something that's coming, um, I do recall that the Bible said that the world would never be destroyed by water again. So, uh, let's see. Uh, part of the new law has already been written. The new law is not written on paper, but in the spirit of the universe. Then a mere book from the prophets will arise. People have already begun to perceive the awakening of the universe as well as the control system combined with governments and reptilians. I am assuming the judgment of the universe refers to God or the creator. That's just my thought. The next part is pretty amazing. <clears throat> And I think you will pick up on why. Oli continues from the last paragraph. The interpretation reads like this. They begin to perceive the earth that is weakening. Ivana is not disappointed, but beware of America's principles. It is a collage of media anger and heartlessness. Media anger and heartlessness. Interesting. I got it. Yeah, we, we do not like Ivana to explore for her own benefit. We are already connected for a long earthly time, and we would show regret if people were condemned by the computer. Not sure, but that might mean condemned by hackers or, or somebody interested in our demise. They have no right, this is Oli, they have no right to interfere with you, Ilona and Ivana. They do not like the truth I tell them. Yes, they can refute everything. We follow it. We follow the events around you. It is our job to find out that you do not hurt USA resources. It is not our symbol to tell everything that is cosmic and dangerous. We also have to take care of humanity in general, I, I believe. Uh, Ivana was not created for the physical learning process, interesting, but for a telepathic connection with us, with Oli. We are linked together from our past mental development. Our sharing is already well known in the U.S., and that is why our interest is growing in the exploration of the talks about you, Ilona and Ivana. It's dangerous, and we are under constant surveillance. Now, there is more to the message, but I haven't really sat down with it. This is what we're going to do this week, and somebody yelled out, I got it. That was me. What, what, I, what, what do you think? I got the whole message of everything. Oh, hey, I'll tell you what, can can we save that? Because I, I think I went on a little too long. Okay. <laughs> I want to get Tom on here. All right. Uh, all right let me get Tom on here. Uh, our guest tonight is Tom Reed, and Tom Reed uh, is an amazing person. He grew up in the home of William Roosevelt, the grandson of President Roosevelt, in Cherry Hills, Colorado. His grandmother was employed by the Roosevelts with residents on the property. Tom's late father, Dr. Howard Reed, was an attorney and in public office. As of October 2015, the Reed UFO case of September 1st, 1969, is officially the first UFO case to be inducted into the United States as historically significant and true event. This is per the office of the governor and that of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Historical Society. In 2015, a 500 pound monument, a 5,000 pound, 500, like a 5,000 pound monument was unveiled on its 46th anniversary in honor of this modern day history. The Tom Reed UFO Monument Park was built this past summer and actually sits at the precise location of that September 1st, 1969 encounter in Sheffield, Massachusetts. The park represents progress and history and will forever remain the location of the first historically true UFO encounter in the U.S. It's open 24 hours a day and free to the public. This UFO encounter has been the subject of several documentaries as well as uh, the launch of Discovery Channel's Alien Mysteries. He is the founder of the International Model Management Agency, Miami Models, and director of Paraween, a celebrity-hosted paranormal conference held in Salem during Salem Haunted Happenings, and it is considered an ABA Top 100 event. 
So, Tom, how are you? It's been a long time, buddy. Hey, it's been two years. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, any time, man. All you have to do is call. I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier. I guess but I any- didn't think of it either. <laughs> <laughs> Should I call just sooner? Yeah. But anyway, anyway, uh, you know, there's a lot of people. We've we've garnered a, a pretty big audience, and uh, there are people out there that might not have ever heard of Tom Reed and, and the significance of of why you're alive and the family is alive and the and the situation uh, that makes them so famous. Um, let's go back sure. to 1966. I think that was the very first contact, isn't it? It's the first thing I remember, yeah. yeah. Um, it, all three, uh, the, the events we had were all uh, from 66 to 69. But yeah, 66 was the first time that I uh, remember um, being personally involved in something. Although my mother, uh, reflecting back, she um, remembered something back in 1954, which is I think why that when this took place with us that she was, uh, I guess, not a novice to it. And she kind of um, – when we were talking about what we saw and what what happened, I mean, she wasn't as shocked as most uh, maybe family members or parents would have been. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, '66, my um, my brother and I remember. Um, my God, I remember seeing the uh, the uh, I've mentioned like a turtle shell looking craft and yeah, yeah. and uh, you know uh, the the area where this thing had uh, touched down, I guess, or sat and. And going back on my horse afterwards and, and ducking along the main and going through this brush and everything because I couldn't believe I had seen it myself, you know, that kind of a thing. And then seeing the area and seeing this rock or boulder that was right there that I remember seeing. And it just made this very surreal event. Um, it just took such a different uh, weight to it. I mean, it made me realize that this, you know, even though other people were there and saw it too, that it just – it it solidified everything and mm-hmm. and left such a um, a weird feeling, you know, almost as if I uh, was different, you know, like I like I was more of a visitor, you know, here than than a native to here. And I had wow, these, even as a child, I had these different uh, thoughts. And then, um, of course, sixty seven, uh, you know, a year older, even at that age, I I remember sixty seven was just mind blowing. I mean, my my family was uh, all involved in that too, and. And that one I remember um, even more so. Just maybe being a year older made a difference. But I remember my mother, um, I guess the first thing I remember about that night was we had a window that was open. Back in the day, we had, um, you know, we had to leave our windows open, you know, to, uh, for air conditioning. You know, we oh, right, didn't have, right. you know, we, so we got a breeze. And we had like this little brook in the back of our yard. And, and um, it, it, my mother came in to shut the window because uh, you might have remember talking about this before that she thought it was going to rain, you know, because she saw these weird flashes of light and my brother mm, had seen mm-hmm. them too. But they didn't actually come straight down to the ground if, you know, speaking, you know, talking to them afterwards and getting their their um, opinion of what happened that night. Because you reflect, you know, you kind of look back and you go, wow, I remember, you know, this was not, you know, really, this was, was odd. The lightning strikes were odd and they kind of went along the sky rather than coming down to the ground, like, you know, to ground out. Right. And she had come in and said, uh, you know, I'm going to shut the window. I think there's going to be a storm, but I don't hear any thunder. And um, she had left. And my brother was on the top bunk. We had bunk beds at the time, and there was a radiator underneath the, the window. And it was kind of a small room, actually. And we remember what looked like uh, orbs. I think I've told, talked to you about that, like this little orb about the size of a plate. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing that, and it almost looked like something was um, moving in it. I remember staring at it like it was looking at me, and I was looking back at it. And uh, it just kind of rolled, almost like an ocean wave. And it was very strange. And we, I saw that. And, and, um, and at the same time, that wasn't far from the window. So I, and I was also looking at the window. And um, this is where I really kind of got kind of weird. Now, this is about 11 o'clock, I'd say maybe 10, 11. And um, my brother was eating animal crackers. I remember that. And we had a ladder that went down the side of the bunk bed. So I was hanging off the side of the bed and looking – you know, I kind of threw the ladder in the bed frame out the window, and I saw this little circle of light. It almost looked like a hula hoop. It wasn't a solid light. It was like a, a ring, you know, like a mm-hmm. wedding band. And it was white and, and it had blue around it, and I was staring at it. And um, 
kind of couldn't take my eyes off it because there really wasn't anything there. It was just a, a brook, some trees, and like an alfalfa field. And and so I'm staring at this thing, and I'm kind of drawn to it because it's it, it was just weird. And all of a sudden, I just remember feeling like I was no longer laying on my bed, like I was standing up and then inverted almost upside down and then wrapped in like um, packaging, almost like um, – like you would ship something in that, um, you know, those packets that look like they're filled with air or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and just flipped, and and, uh, and like a whitewash, and like being hit again, with like an ocean wave of some kind. And then I, and then, um, you know, I, I was no longer in the room. My brother had said he ran down the, the steps. He, um, he saw that what he says fired in the room. Went to wake up my mother. She wouldn't respond. Went to wake up my grandmother. She wouldn't, you know, they were bunking together because we had a, a relative at the time who came in from New York City and was mm-hmm. taking over my grandmother's room. So my my grandmother, Mary, and my mother were sharing a, a room at the time. Neither one of them would respond. And then after, I don't know, he says about 10, 15 minutes, I guess, he got between the wall, was kicking my mother, trying to wake her. And finally she came too. And she grabbed Matthew and started going back to the room that, he was like, Tom's gone, Tom's gone kind of thing, and was going across the staircase. And then all of a sudden it sounded like a bunch of doors slamming simultaneously, a boom, boom. And then my mother says Matthew was no longer standing next to her. Wow. And she doesn't really think or know for sure if that was minutes that went by or half an hour that went by because, you know, it's – you know, you hear these noises and then all of a sudden you, you, you're – you realize that something's different, and you, and you don't know if you blacked out. You know what happened? Yeah, yeah. And, time gets weird. Yeah, and so at that point, I remember being in this hallway that uh, shaped almost like a question mark. I've talked about that a lot, and I was standing at this room, this area of a room, looking into a much darker room, and remember, you know, this, you know, this is very surreal and the way it looked everything was soft and white and kind of it was you know smooth and just kind of uh, you know it was surreal to me as a kid you know um, right right and and my brother all of a sudden was standing next to me and before he had, I had seen him I remember being in front or being faced by someone or something that was very human-like, but not not human to me. Um, and staring or trying to connect or something was uh, there was a we were facing each other, and I started to get um, yeah, I guess not cooperating or coming in and out of this calm. And I I, I don't think that I was um, you know behaving the way I was expected to maybe. Mm-hmm. And and I, I was crying out for my brother and that's when I noticed he was there so it part of me wonders if my needing him there even if it was a selfish thing to me you know kind of like I wanted I needed to have someone else there to as, as so I wouldn't be alone maybe so I was crying out for him and then all of a sudden he was brought to me so I don't know if that's what happened or if it was just that we were we were um, taken at different times and mm-hmm. you know where that alignment was but I remember um, feeling at the time that they, this person or individual, understood me, maybe, but I couldn't understand them. And um, you know, being nervous and being uh, uncomfortable, and and um, you know, uh, you know, where's Matt? Where's Matt? And then all of a sudden he's there. So that was kind of strange. And then yeah. my mother that night um, had um, panicked, and we had a screen porch with an outside floodlight on it. That was on a telephone pole on our property, and my grandmother went out on the screen porch. They put on the floodlights. My mother jumped on a horse, and uh, was looking around the property for us. She, um, we had a hay baler on the hill, and we weren't allowed to go past this hay baler. So she knew that if you know, I guess in her own mind that if something had happened, you know, there's no reason we should be past that hay baler, even though she really didn't know at the time what happened. You know, her her thinking was, well, you know, if they're on a property, they shouldn't be past the hay baler. And so, she, but she went up higher. She went up on the hill and looked down, 
and um, we were nowhere to be seen. You know, we were in a house, and this is in, in her eyes, just seconds later after Matthew, you know, maybe two minutes afterwards, mm. then says she was with Matthew, and we were nowhere to be found. And about, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes later, all of a sudden, there we were in the driveway facing each other. And I remember wow. that like it was yesterday. I remember all of a sudden, I, I'm back in our driveway, and I'm on a hill. Our, hill, our, our property was on a pretty steep incline, and I was on a hill next to the stable, and my brother was maybe, I don't know, 20 feet, you know, in front of me. Mm -hmm. We're staring, staring at each other. And what's weird about this is I remember this very vividly. I remember my brother does too, and that we were just, uh, just kind of locked on each other. And my mother would tell you that we were very placid and not responsive and that we were almost in shock. But to my brother and I, we were sharp as a tack. I remember uh -huh. seeing him. I remember everything around us. I remember my mother coming up and scooping him up. I remember um, her grabbing me. She sat us on the kitchen table. She gave us aspirin, orange juice, wiped us off with towels. Uh, my brother was playing with a little soda, metal tin soda top, mm -hmm. um, and was very fixated on it. And was, He says it was acting kind of peculiar to him, but, but um, we were taken into the living room. Um, she tried to get us to respond and by throwing the stuff into the fireplace that would, you know, change the color of the flames, trying to get us out of this funk. Hey, but Tom. Not, but to us, we weren't in one. Yeah. Tom, can we hold it right there? Because sure. um, uh, we got to go into our first break. I can't believe it's 1027 already. I know. Um, so it, it, you're listening to the Starborn Connection. can only be found on KGRA, your contact to the multiverse. Mm -hmm. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation. And Angioprim is the result, a safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from Angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio, A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M. Angioprim.com slash radio or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. Our world is a world of mysteries. Strange disappearances, unusual happenings, mysterious phenomena. And this November, you can learn about the greatest mysteries of our time by joining us on the Mysteries Cruise. Enjoy several days at sea and attend exclusive private lectures with leading personalities like researcher Rosemary Ellen Guiley, author of more than 49 books, including The Gin Connection, podcaster Jim Harold, host of The Paranormal Podcast, and writer and researcher Micah Hanks of The Graylian Report. Set sail this November 8th through the 13th, 2017, aboard the Crown Princess and sail with us into the heart of mystery. Make your reservations before time runs out by visiting mysteriescruise.com today or reserve by phone at 877-642-4308. That number again is 877-642-4308. The mysteries of our time await you. Visit mysteriescruise.com. On the next episode of Recipes for Disaster. So we've got our neighbor Paul coming over tonight for a barbecue, which is why I prepared a delicious lemon rosemary steak marinade for my special collection of old family recipes. To make sure the steaks are extra, extra, extra tender, I left them marinating out on the counter overnight, just like Nana used to. Maria may mean well, but without food safety, it never ends well. Always thaw or marinate foods in the refrigerator at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below. Or you could make your friends and family really sick. Maria's neighbor Paul didn't think twice about the steak he ate until he was presenting his company's financial forecast to the board. That's when a sudden bout of food poisoning made it explicitly clear that profits weren't the only thing on the rise. Oh. Watch Recipes for Disaster at foodsafety.gov. You'll learn the right steps as Maria does everything wrong. 
Brought to you by the USDA, HHS, and the Ad Council. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the second portion of our show. The time is speeding, and we're not going to waste any. So I'm going to turn it back over to Tom. We're going to move onward in time a little bit um, to the, some of the more important areas. Uh, Tom, you said 69 was more important. Well, yeah, the 69 is where – okay, let me, let me uh, re- – I'm going to give you a quick synopsis on where I'm going with this because I, I, it's important. Right. The, our case did get inducted into state, and 69 was really the reason why oh. – but 66 and 67 played in a, a huge part in that because what happened to us in 66 and 67 is what we used to talk about at the Village on the Green restaurant in Sheffield. We owned the only eatery in town. Everyone ate there. It was the only spot to eat, and it was right across the street from the school. And we were not local. You know, We moved in from out of state, and we didn't fit in this little farming town community, if you will, mm. to begin with. So we were kind of outsiders from the time we got there. So when we or my mother or the cook and those working at the restaurant would try to talk to those coming in for coffee or pancakes in the morning, just like your hairdresser, right? You have these conversations that you wouldn't normally have with other people. Right. And my mother thinking – now remember, my mother was only 27 years old and she was single at the time. (laughs) If she wasn't married to Howard at the time. So she was talking to these people like, oh my god, you know – my my son and and Matthew and you know whatever that you know what we experienced and what we saw and what we took part in, thinking you know maybe those would be a little bit more understanding, but it, they weren't. You know the town kind of divided and there were fights that broke out. There were arguments. There were police reports and and those people that were in that restaurant in '66 and '67 and '68 '69 talking about. Our event is part of the reason there were police reports and archives and how this divided the community, which made it historically significant. Wow. You follow me? So yeah. in so in sixty nine, which was absolutely mind blowing, um, was the the one incident that we were not the only ones who took part in it or saw it. And that's why it became such a community thing. So in in sixty nine, I was actually I used to ride horses. My mother raised horses. I was at the Ski Butternut in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. They used to have rides there for kids on, on in the summer. And so I competed with 4-H. And that night, um, I got a brown ribbon. My saddle came loose. I blew it. I was embarrassed. It was horrible. You know, I got – yeah, it was terrible. So she took us back to Village on the Green to close up because it was a holiday. We had to cook working late and stayed open late. So my mother took, went back to the store to make the cash deposit drop. And make sure the chairs were up and the place was clean. It was locked up. Okay, so we went back to the village on the green in Sheffield. Well, when she came in, everything was cool. Got the money out of the safe, and we went to the bank, dropped the money in, and my grandmother went into a place called Silks, which they still remember this today. Um, Silk store. It's still there today. And we we left Silks and we're heading back towards Butternut or the ski resort because. The restaurant was further than our home, and so we decided to take a shortcut, and we went over the Sheffield Bridge where the monument is today. And as we were going across the bridge, um, it was a really old bridge at the time, you know, clanky boards, the whole bit. And there was just something ominous about that whole night. I mean, like it was just strange, you know, when you just go outside and you're like, it was a weird feeling. And, and you had that foreboding, right? Something, yeah, something yeah. was different, and. And so we went across the bridge, came out the other side, and just as we were coming out, I started to give my – unwrap a, a fireball candy to give to my brother. My grandmother turned around from the passenger seat to say, hey, don't give him that. He could choke. And when she did, she saw this light come up, which – you know, and now this is a long time ago, but we've always referenced it like a Hershey's kiss upside down. There, huh. always, there seemed to be like a light – Maybe it was reflecting from the water, but it looked like an upside-down silver Hershey's kiss of light rising from the water. 
Now, a lot of people say, oh, the UFO was over your car. No, it was not. It was never over our car. It was it was ne- out of the water to the left of the bridge on the Great Barrington side, not on the Sheffield side of the bridge. And it rose up higher than the bridge and it started to move over a cornfield behind a line of trees. Now, we kept going, but we were going slow because we we're all looking at this thing, even my mother, and she's driving. So she's you know probably going 10 miles an hour at this point. And we kind of, as we drove down this narrow dirt road, we're looking through the trees and we see this like flicker of light. So we don't know if the if the car is causing this light, but it almost looked like a little bit of a strobe, you know. So we don't know if this thing's flashing. If we're, so my mother pulled off to the side. I believe she stopped. She doesn't know if the car stopped on its own or she stopped. It was a long time ago, but we were off to the side of the road. And sure enough, it was right there in this break of trees. You can go there today. I can show you exactly where it was. And it was just there. It was this big it was like a light, but you couldn't you couldn't really make out anything defined within the light. But then again, the light was defined enough that it, whatever it was, it was covering it, you know, pretty, pretty like a like a like if a, you had a light bulb that was maybe um, you know like an LED light, right? Not that bright. I mean, it's it's a light, but it's still the shape of something, you know? Right, right. And it it was off to the left, and we're staring at it. And I'm look, I start to turn back to my right to look at my my brother Matthew, and I noticed there was something almost like glowing or like uh, like um, like a goldish orange off to the right. And so I'm looking back and forth. And I remember doing this, looking back at this thing, looking over to my right, thinking maybe something was reflecting onto maybe I don't know. Now I look back and I say maybe it was reflecting off water, maybe it was reflecting off a stone or a rock or something shiny like an old car and a lot. Who knows what it was, but. I saw it was just strange. I kept looking back and forth, looking back and forth, and all of a sudden I could see inside the car. Now because it was dark and the light was above our car over on behind the trees, so our car was actually still dark inside, so I could see this glowing thing out the window next to my brother, and all of a sudden the car lit up. I wow. could see the dashboard. I could see the – we had blue, like that blue plastic leather back in the day. I could see my grandmother. I could see the radio. I could see the back of the seats. So this thing either lowered – and the light came in or shined a light in our direction, which came through the windows. But now I could see inside the car. I remember the, you know, as we were stopping too, it was like you could hear this crunching of stones and rocks underneath the tires. It was just that creepy sound. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was like it was like someone just flipped a switch off on life itself. It was all of a sudden it just got dull and like being in the middle of a hurricane, like a barometric change in pressure, and bang, it was just like you know, surreal again, and all of a sudden you're like almost, um, you know, like outside your body kind of thing. You know, that whole thing where you're just not really there. Right. And all of a sudden there was this eruption of crickets and cadians, and it was super loud. And that's the last thing I remember in the car. Um, I remember afterwards. I remember um, getting up or, or sliding off a table of some kind and getting up to my feet. Um, I have a lot of references as a kid because that's how I made sense of all this. Like I remember this cart next to me, like uh, uh, um, like a silver cart that you put like a slide projector on or something in school back right, had the right. wheels on it. And but what I got off of, I don't even remember what it was. I just remember sliding down to my feet and looking up, and it was like this big open space. And I I've referenced it looked like an airplane hangar. I'm not saying it was an airplane hangar, but it was that it resembled, if anything, to give up give up. Yeah, yeah, it was that big, big and open. And something else that was unique that I look back on was that in the corner where the wall went up to the ceiling, there were these lines of light, almost like a sing- singular fluorescent tube, which also has me thinking, well, you know, almost, or like a, a huge fat glow stick of some kind. Yeah. In the corners were this, and there was like a, a light, a space, a light, a space, a light. And this thing went for quite some time. So I'm thinking if those lights, you know, were three feet or so, and there must have been about eight or nine of them, that's a, big this thing was plus the space in between so it was a pretty big area so i'm standing there now just nothing and all of a sudden there's this i see this light either a door opened or something i don't remember exactly all of a sudden there was a light in front of me and this individual starts to walk in and i say individual because again i was young was walking um you know did not look all that human to me but you know was it a hybrid? I have, you know, something along those lines. I, I don't really know exactly, but it walked towards me 
And I remember being grabbed by my left arm very tightly to the point where it hurt. Then I was taken back out this doorway where this this hybrid or what have you grabbed me and walked me out of where he just came from and took a quick right. And these hallways were super high. The hallways were not that wide, the ones I walked down. And I'm saying these things are probably, I'm guessing again, maybe 10 or 15 foot ceilings. And then as I got to the end of this hallway, again, it wasn't like in 66 or 67 where these hallways kind of turned and were smooth in the way that they angled. This was a left and a right, very industrial by design. And I was taken to the left and took quick into a room off to the right. So I was in this big room, walked out the, the hall, this area being pretty much escorted out by my left arm and not nicely either <laughs> to a right. And to, I mean, the whole thing kind of hurt. I mean, I wasn't being like pulled. It was like the person was next to me behind me and grabbed me and kind of walked me from behind. Right. And then when I got into this room, this wall bowed inward, like almost like a glass and like a big coffee can, you know, of glass or looked like glass. And there was a pocket to the left between where this rounded area would have stopped. And then this wall started on each end. And the rest of the room had this, you know, spot that I sat on. And I remember just sitting there looking at this bowed in glass area. And then I noticed to my left what I've sketched since I was very young, which to me looked like an you know, again, I was using references as a child, but looked like an ant to me. Mm-hmm. Um, some people say, oh, it was a reptilian or it was this. I don't need to be told what it was because yeah, I've no, seen I'm, picture, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing pictures of what others describe, and this thing just looked very different. I'm it, looking at it, yeah. It does. It, <laughs> it had a head. I remember the head more than anything was about the size of a football, and and it had like an orangey, goldish tint to it. Which looked like a red fire ant. The red fire ant's redder, but that's what it looked. The head. It didn't have like had holes in its head. It, the, the eyes looked like it was all part of the, what would be a football. Smooth. Mm-hmm. Nothing stuck out. And I remember the arms and the legs on this thing looked like bamboo. And I lived in Florida for 30 years, so they re, when I see bamboo yeah. sticks, that's <laughs> right. what it reminds me of. And that's where it actually bothers me to this day because there was no thickness variations in it. It was stick like, and and I don't know if it was uh, like Uncanny Valley. I don't know if it was alive. I don't know, you know, um, you know, if it was under intelligent control, if it thought for itself. I have no idea. Uh, all I can say is what I saw looked to be living. It looked to be somewhat intelligent. It was facing a wall. It what didn't really look at me. It scanned at one point. It moved. Um, it did raise and lower. Um, I have no idea other than that. I can tell you, you know, people say, oh, I know what I saw. Well, I know what I saw, but I don't know what it was. You know, it's like you see yeah. something on Halloween. You're like, okay, I know what I saw, but it doesn't mean you don't know what it really is. So, but this thing bothered me to the point it put chills down my back. Even talking about it right now, my hair is standing up. I r- got up and I had run out the right corner, the opposite corner of this bowed in glassed area. And I did. I got up and I ran. So I wasn't calmed. I mean, I was, I was nervous. I was scared. I mean, it, this bothered me emotionally, physically. I mean, I got up and I ran out this corner of this room. When I ran out this room, the area that I entered was humongous. It was a huge open area. When I say open area, I mean three quarters the size of a, of a gutted Walmart. I mean, this was a huge, freaking open, rounded area that had three hallways coming into it. One right to my right. I mean, right to my right. One across the way that looked about as wide as a two-lane highway and the one to my left, which more like a four or six-lane highway. Mm-hmm. So it had like this wide configuration that went into the circle. And I, I remember just standing there like, you know, it was just – and I, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to, what to make of it. I was grabbed. I was put back on this table. Um, this thing came over me that looked like a tanning bed cover or maybe like an MRI machine type of thing. It had holes in it. This piece separated. One, I thought it was to keep me in place from running, but it didn't come that close to my body. But I didn't actually move either. There were holes in the side of this thing. Hands came through it. There were these packets put on me that looked like big raisins. Hmm. Um, the thing separated and closed together. Uh, what like was like the 
what I was sitting on rose and what came from the ceiling lowered at the same time, almost like it sandwiched me. Mm -hmm. And when it met, when I say met, I mean, it was still maybe six inches above my chest. The hands were coming through the side of it and something was being done. I remember I bumped to my head and, and next thing I know, I'm back in this big area again. And I remember hearing voices. I remember hearing what I thought was my mom call out to me. Um, I've said this many times. I don't know if it was my mother. She said she was, you know, crying out. Um, but yeah, it was just strange. And so we're back in the car now. I don't know. Just that's what happened next. But the strange thing was my mother and grandmother were reversed. Okay. My mother, when we drove, she was driving. My grandmother was in the passenger seat. Mm-hmm. When we came to, my mother was out in the passenger seat. My grandmother was in the driver's seat. She took the car, dr- finished going down this road a little ways till she could turn it around and drove it back to Silks for help because she didn't know three hours had gone by. Silks was just locking up at, you know, after staying open as late as they could because it was a holiday. And she walked in and was in somewhat of a – a, a daze. I mean, she was kind of walking aimlessly. I've said before, she was kind of almost like you were drunk, right? Or like, you know, to a degree. And I heard the door slam, I guess, because I woke up after she was already out of the car. And I was, you know, Nana, Nana, and I followed her into silks. And she just kind of walked right by the clerk mm. and got tied up in these bikes and strollers and that kind of thing. I mean, she wasn't thinking very, very clearly. Either was I, really. And uh, so this is all part of how it got inducted because these people still live in town today. Even 50, 60 years later, whatever it was, you know, this has been going on in that area for a long time. And and so we left, went home. Um, we had no idea that it was broadcast on WSBS radio that night. Wow. And the next morning when we went into the into the restaurant. Now, I used to get up in the morning really early and ride with my mother to go open up the restaurant because otherwise I had to walk three, you know, quarter of a mile to the school bus and wait for the school bus basically by myself, or I could ride into work with her, have have eggs, pancakes, or whatever, and just uh-huh. ride my bike across the street to school. So I used to go to the restaurant with her in the morning. It was unbelievable. For the next m- months, people were like, I'm sorry, Nancy. We didn't believe you. We saw it too. There were reports that came in from Jug End Resort. It was given a Hynek classification. Whether It's it's not in Project Blue Book. I don't know why it is, but it was given a Hynek classification. It was an F, you know, uh, a CE1 at the time is because it was called in and witnessed by four people at Juggin Resort, uh, Juggin, Massachusetts. But it was seen in Lennox, Mass. It was seen in Lee. It was seen in Stockbridge, Great Barrington, Sheffield. And so these reports were coming into the radio station. People were coming into the restaurant talking to us because now remember – when we talked about this in 66 and 67, there was a lot of people that, oh, sure, you know, you guys from out of town, you know, whatever. Right. And so right. now, this has been now three years now that this has been conversation at our restaurant. So that is kind of what fueled everything. So at this point, um, you know, it, it uh, there were police reports. There were archives. And, and um, so to take this now to jump ahead again, because um, I don't have much time left, I guess. Um, my my father, uh, my mother met my dad, Howard. Um, he became an attorney. He knew he wasn't going to be elected running for office in, in Massachusetts because still, even though people kind of came to her aid and said, you know, we, sorry, we acted that way, it still wasn't the best place to run for office. Mm, so we moved right. over to, to Canaan, Connecticut, where we bought the house and the property where the Peter Riley murder trial took. Remember the Peter Riley case? Hmm. Barbara Gibbons, Death and Canaan, the book. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, we bought the house and the property that murder took place on. So, oh, God. Things, yeah. <laughs> right, that's my been my life, you know what I mean? It's I mean, one thing after another, but but it was cheap. <laughs> so it was a lot of property for the money. So my father said, oh, let's, let's get this. So, um, so anyway, um, I always had some weird feelings about uh, – the house I had a hard time living, you know, staying there. I became very sensitive about a lot of things. Um, I never felt like I belonged. I always felt like an outsider. I was, mm. I don't know. It was just weird the way I felt. This affected me in a lot of ways. But at the same time, I don't. I'm glad it happened in some respects because I don't look at it as a bad thing. I just look at it as something that was extraordinary, and I was I was part of something. But mm. but at the same time, um, my father ended up meeting Robert Fletchman, who was an attorney. At a, 
and who ran the same circles my father did once he was in office. And he had just so happened to be the public relations director for MUFON at the time. And so he took an interest in the case because he was actually looking into the um, Hudson River Valley UFO sightings and it happened to be over water. Our case was over water. You know, there were magnetic anomalies, that kind of thing. And Cash Landerman had the, you know, uh, damage to their vehicle. So there were some things at the time that he wanted to be able to say, hey, look, you know, there's a family just outside New York who, you know, he's an attorney, blah, blah, blah. He's had a very similar type of thing. So he wanted to mention it on the back end of some other things, and he did. And so he mentioned our case um, on, Oct- on October 2nd, um, 19, um, 1992. And um, unfortunately, um, my father ended up you know, losing his life on the same day. Mm. So mm. when it happened, when my father, who was a politician and was very interested in this topic, he was also looking into and in researching what was going on in that town um, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And there was government mining for magnesium. There was actually a, a base there. Um, now, you got to remember the Berkshires, and you live out that way. There's Nike missile sites. There's... Um, uh, you know, Minutemen missile sites, you know, there's a, you, you, you know, they're in the mountains out there, yet you never right. see the government actually making them, right? But, right. But, but at the same time, if you look, you know, then you, if you look into this and you look into what's really going on in the mountains out there in the Berkshires, there's a lot going on out there. Anyway, if you, in, in Canaan, Connecticut, they were mining for magnesium and there was a plutonium spill and this magnesium was actually used that was mined just not next to our restaurant. That's where it was mined from. I'm talking two miles or so, maybe three. Wow. Jeez. And that was actually sent to Oak Ridge. And, and, and so there was a lot of government in the area in the 40s and 50s. Now, apparently, according to the library and historian Kevin Titus, again, how this got inducted, um, there, there was a spill. And because they didn't know how to treat it, I guess – they they locked down this facility for a while. They kind of abandoned it, but they would still go and take readings and so on. So that meant that there was government working in an underground base mm, during right. the time this happened to us, which again was reported to the Historical Society. So when this happened with my father and he passed, the town itself decided, you know what? We're going to look into it because out of respect for him and a lot of the talk in town – and with uh, some people in the historical society, some people who owned, you know, 1,000 acres of property there, gas stations and everything else, these people I went, that came to our restaurant in the early days were all pillars in the community today. So they they gave testimony, statements, radio archives, um, and so it went to a vote. I took a polygraph test, you know that. And with the classifications and everything else and, and what they were able to uncover, it came down to this. It came down to – the first time it got – it didn't go in. The first time it was like, no, we're not going to induct it. But then um, they said, well, was this significant enough that it altered the natural progression of the community? And the way it was mentioned to me on the phone was that if Billy the Kid robbed a train and just did it one day, he just would have been another – you know, punk with a gun, right? But right. Because because it happened for so many years, it altered the pro- natural progression of the area. Wow. So if this could be proven that '66 and the hassles in our restaurant, the you know the guys taking breaking themselves out and saying to my mother at 26 years old, "You want to see something out of this world, Nancy?" in the middle of a restaurant, <laughs> that it had, it had been so um, there's so many. Um, Arguments and and um, paper trail and police reports and that that it that it did divide a small town and the surrounding townships. So it went to a census and they actually voted and yes, they proved that as a whole that our UFO involvement, this case, this off-world incident, they recalled it, was proven to have altered the natural progression of the community. Wow. It affected bus drivers. It affected school. It, some people weren't allowed to eat at the restaurant anymore because they didn't want to be associated with the topic. Wow. Um, Jeez. Yep. So that's how it really got inducted was that our case affected a community so profoundly that it had altered the progression of that township. Oh, I man. That's, that's something else. That's the only else. case that I know of. Yeah. Really? Wow. Well, well, listen, and, it's it's yeah. about that time again. 
I, quick, I can't right? t- I can't take yeah. it. Yeah, it's it mo- things are moving too fast. Uh, we're going to have to move to another break. I uh, just want to remind you guys out there uh, that you're listening to the Starborn Connection radio show. comes to you every Saturday night live on KGRA, your connection to the multiverse. See you on the other side. Hi, this is Matt Ray for My Pillow. Look, I'd forgotten what a good night's sleep was like. Then I got a hold of My Pillow. I used to wake up with neck and shoulder pain. I thought it was the new normal. But after one night of using My Pillow, my neck and shoulder pain is gone and I'm sleeping comfortably through the night. My Pillow's patented interlocking fill conforms to your personal sleep needs. It's guaranteed not to go flat. It's washable, it's dryable, and it's made in the USA, not to mention the 10 year warranty. Try it risk free with a 60 day money back guarantee. What have you got to lose besides back pain and shoulder pain? Right now, America's First News has a great deal. Try it for yourself. Call now. You'll get 50% off a four pack. That's two premium pillows and two travel pillows. Call now, 800 716 4835. Use the promo code RAY, R A Y. That's 800 716 4835. Use the promo code RAY. For the thousands of wounded warriors returning from battle, Wounded Warrior Project has developed the Warriors to Work program, a career counseling service that helps wounded warriors translate their military experience to a civilian job. These extraordinary men and women bring more than just teamwork and inspiration to the workplace. They bring proven world-class job skills. And to ensure proper placement, Wounded Warrior Project works with employers to find just the right job fit. Talented, skilled, and eager to get back to work, you have the opportunity to hire a seasoned veteran. Contact Wounded Warrior Project at findwwp.org. Welcome home, the brave. For years, the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station has been your contact for live UFO paranormal talk radio worldwide, bringing you the top names in research and investigations seven nights a week. Our listeners connect to the KGRA on various platforms like TalkStream Live, TuneIn, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and many more. Now, you can stream your favorite paranormal talk radio shows with our new fully integrated custom KGRA mobile apps for Android and iPhones. Listen to your favorite paranormal talk shows from any mobile device 24-7 free with smartphone or tablet. Utilize custom features to access news, show pages, archives, contests, events, and live interactive chat room. Set Set show notification alerts and never miss your favorite live programs. All free and available to download in Google Play or the iTunes App Store. We are the contact for alternative research topics. The Planet, KGRARadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back. And uh, I, I, we have a, another wonderful guest here, uh, Sean Stowe, who uh, you're responsible basically for um, how, how did that work with you and the monument? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I am a talent manager uh, for a lot of well-known actors, and, and one of the famous ones is Jake the Snake Roberts. I work with him, and I was doing a lot of research and stuff online um, as far as different conventions that were out there and, you know, just kind of, um, you know, looking into some different things that maybe some of my people could get involved with. And I happened to come across a lot of information on Tom's story. And um, it it was so fascinating. And I I started seeing all of the news coverage and everything. And I was watching anything and everything that I could. And I was reading about the monument. And I was like, wow, this, this would be a great area to, like, 
you know, preserved and safe, you know, because it's such a huge part of history. And, you know, I really thought that the town really should be thanked for, you know, sticking by Tom and his family and coming forth and sharing their story of what they witnessed. And um, so I started reaching out to some people and um, including, you know, Ben Hansen from Factor Fake and Mm -hmm. Travis Walton from Fire in the Sky. And then um, I contacted the International um, Roswell UFO Museum and I started talking to them in regards to, you know, really um, putting together this whole thing with the park. And they were so behind it. Everyone was behind it. So I got them to um, sponsor some park benches to put in. Um, I actually made a trip up there. I got in contact with Tom and he was, he was like so blown away. He was so humbled and he was like, Oh my God, like, thank you. You know? And I was like, no, I really, I really think that this is something that needs, that needs to be preserved in the history. It's, it's going to continue on and only get better. So, um, you know, I, I asked him, I said, can you, you know, would you meet me up there? And he, he made his trip up and I got a chance to meet him and, uh, you know, just started, I started working on the park and getting everything, you know, uh, cleaned up and, and everything. And it's, it's, it's gorgeous up there. Me and my daughter made another trip up because we want to, you know, continue to further expand the park and people from the community and everything were coming through and thanking us for doing it. And they loved it. Um, you know, we got sponsorships from a director in California for solar lights and, um, you know, it's it's been an amazing journey, but it's only going to get better. It's only going to continue to grow. So it is I'm amazing. Excited. Yeah, it really yeah. is. And uh, you know, it, it's just I haven't even been up there to see it yet. I mean, and and I'm sh- ashamed of that. I, sh- I I really should let you know, but uh, I'll get up there probably later this year. Uh, Julia and I are planning on taking a trip up to. Uh, see our producer and spend some time uh, doing a live broadcast, maybe we can shoot over the other way and see that place too. I don't know. That whether sounds it's, like a plan. Yeah, we could do something like that. <laughs> well, anyway. Oh, it's, uh, the, it's gorgeous. You'll love it there. Uh, hey, Tom, I, I, yeah. I want to get back to what you were saying earlier because there, there was a couple of things that uh, you, know, you wanted to cover. So I'm going to put you back on uh, okay. here to finish that up and then you know we'll We'll do well, what we can. Okay. Since we're on the topic of the of the um, the park, I, yeah, I was really um, be honest with you. I, you probably remember the how the monument was vandalized and spray painted. And mm, yeah. Remember all that in 2015? Well, that yeah. really came. That really stemmed from a from a um, a jackass reporter by the name of Terry Cowgill, and he uh, wrote some things in the paper that were absolutely not true. He also misquoted the township itself. So what happened with that was it put a stop on it, and people actually got – the people who actually paid for that monument – that monument wasn't given to me by the state. The monument was built by donations by mm-hmm. a select few Wow! because they had given testimony. They had seen it too. There's crop circles that apparently showed up there in 2012 and 13 on this property not far from the monument. The activity still – goes on there so this is not about me this really isn't we had the restaurant and we became the 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 headlines for it but there were other people that experienced this this is more of a community thing if you go to sheffield Mm -hmm. sean will tell you you go to the park right yeah people walk by and they go i remember seeing it out my window i mean this is not like you think this is not an individual thing this is why it's it's so profound so when when this happened with this reporter and he started bashing the monument, what a stupid thing, a bunch of wackadoodles, right? Mm. It pissed people off. And some people, you know, were going to the town hall and saying, What's going on? I thought we were behind this thing. The all of a sudden the local historical society put their brakes on with the thing until this uh, thing calmed down. Wow. But the chief chief of police, Chief Eric Munson, he's always mm-hmm. been behind it. And and so the police department itself was kind of like, wait a minute, you know what's going on? Because now the thing's being vandalized, it's being spray painted. There's all these weird symbols being, you know, my father's name was X'd out on the plaque. I mean, it was really yeah. disgusting. So what happened in this? This all sounds terrible, but in fact it wasn't, because the community 
was like, this isn't a fair re a reflection of us. This is not who we are. We didn't write these statements. We haven't lived here a whole life. We know what's going on in the area. So they kind of were shocked that this the brakes were put on this thing. And so the chief of police in the community, they we fixed the monument once. And then it happened a second time. Mm. And so at this point, the chief of police was like, okay, you know, we don't know who did it. So therefore, we can't convict somebody and make them pay restitution to fix it. So it sat for like eight or nine months with all this graffiti on it, the whole bit, after it was already fixed once. That's when Sean you know, decided mm -hmm. to, to do something with it because after the first time, people were appalled over it. The second time, it looked like it was going to be an ongoing problem. And so that's when she stepped to the plate and took – you know. Went and talked to the city hall, the landowners, mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't realize where this is either. This monument in this park is exactly where this took place. I mean, if you stand on the opposite side of that bridge, you're you could hit a you could throw a rock to where this UFO was. Wow, that's how close mm -hmm. it is. This is at where you stand is where our car was at that night. So wow. a lot yeah. of people go, hey, this is a you know. Uh, city property or town property or private property. No one really knows where it is. Where this area is, the bridge that we drove over that night was actually burned down in the 1990s. Some, somebody torched it. Well, once the bridge was torched, they put these pylons in front of it so you could no longer drive a vehicle through it. So you can't – the town has a right-of-way for this road that goes through this area of land which is owned by a dairy farm. Uh -huh. Well, Well, now the dairy farm – They've seen the UFOs themselves. They've made reports. If you go to BLT Research, they've actually had those crop circles show up on their cornfields and stuff, mm. which is really weird because you get these weird glowing lights out there. It's very strange. Even Sean saw them. Anyway, yeah. so, so this area where you drive over this bridge was now blocked off. Therefore, the town no longer had the privilege of a right-of-way because they haven't exercised or – been able to maintain their agreement for a right of way, which is meant to be able to get emergency vehicles through an area in case of a fire mm -hmm. or some. So they voided their right of way. Therefore, that town road was actually now the owners of the dairy farm could now take uh, over that property. It's now really theirs again, no longer the town's. So this park. Actually, is on a right of a, a right of way which was not maintained or kept up by the town. So the people who own that property, which they own 1,600 acres and three dairy farms, they gave basically gave the property as you know donated it as a park. That was so, really great. Wow. So therefore, yeah, so therefore, the town can't do anything now with the monument. So the town isn't going to fix it if something happens. So Sean went in and said, look, because you know, now technically it's on private property, theoretically. So she went in and she contacted these. She actually got a lot of financing for it. Mm -hmm. And so the monument was restored. The plaques were restored. Benches were dropped off. They were shipped out from North Carolina. There's plaques on them from Ben Hansen. There's plaques on them from the park, you know, the – uh, at the park, but from the Roswell Museum. Apparently, there's uh, she's working on a uh, – correct me if I'm wrong, but a sculpture or something that's going to take place yeah. at the monument. And um, I know that uh, I think this week or this weekend or this, there's a truckloads uh, of um, – uh, what is it? Uh, what do you, what's going down there? Todd's bringing truckloads of um, – uh, um, of, of mulch. Mulch. I guess they're going to put in plants or something, right? Plants yeah. Oh, wow. Right so they're going yeah. to take this whole area of road that we drove down that day. They're widening the road, and they're making, they're lining it with plants and mulch. Mm -hmm. So this is, she's got this thing. It, it's getting bigger, right yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's growing. Wow. Yeah, it's really freaking cool, and it's all over this legal thing about the right of way not maintaining their responsibility with respect to a right of way. Therefore, nobody can say no to Sean at this point. No. She basically has the, <laughs> the park. It's her thing. She's, she's got the support of the chief of police, the landowners, mm -hmm. 
millionaires in town and all the people that gave testimony to the historical society and the local historical society. Wow. It's part, she's in charge of the whole friggin' thing now. So <laughs> Yeah, and it's crazy. It's her part, they, not mine. They started, <laughs> they, started um, they actually started a Facebook page um, online that's called Old Covered Bridge and um, I came across it and people are actually um, going to the park and they're taking pictures of them sitting on the park bench and standing next to the monument. And, um, you know, I, we went through and, um, like Tom was saying, I went through and fixed the monument and everything, um, so that it looks, it looks gorgeous. And it's, it's put back, um, to the regular color that it was, which is, um, a white color. And, um, you know, I was like, I was a little nervous, you know, at first, because I was like, I hope that nobody does come through and vandalize the property. But people in the community are loving this so much that, like, they, we've, I mean, we've expanded the park out so much and cleared area where they can sit on the park benches and look out over the water. Um, it's it's absolutely beautiful. Didn't they go in there, there. with chains, and, chainsaws and everything? Yeah, chainsaws. Wow. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chainsaws. Yeah. And it's water. It's waterfront too. I mean, you can actually yeah. sit on the bench and overlook the water. You can go fishing. You can sit on your bed. You can go sit on the bench and then walk a few feet and drop your fishing pole in the lake. Sounds really river. heavenly. Yeah. It really does. Sounds yeah, heavenly. It's really yeah. freaking cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm. <laughs> it is. It's. They've done a I great. Wanna eat lunch. So I want to eat lunch on one of those benches overlooking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you would love it. You would love it. I'd love it there. <laughs> Now there's there. also a back entrance too. I mean, now you can come in from mm -hmm. two different angles, and you can. Oh, tell them about what happened with the, uh, with the, with the fl weird fluorescent light, because I want they want I want yes. to that from you. We first time I met yeah. John, I showed her where this whole thing took place, and we were with what four people all together. Yeah, we were with four people. Um, a historian we over. Yeah, it was a, a historian, a local historian, and um, the the land, the actual. Um, owner that had donated the property for the park was there and um, some other prominent figures in the area. And we had, we were over at the park most of the day and um, we had all went out to dinner and um, we so were the judge. After, we were the judge who signed the government's yeah. letter to me. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Sealed the government's yeah. letter. The judge. Yeah. Yep. And we decided um, afterwards to go over back over to the park afterwards and um, it was before, you know, we had had a chance to get um, the benches, you know, cemented in and, and things like that. So, you know, I just wanted to go over there and make sure that, you know, with with the previous vandalism and everything, I wanted to make sure that the benches stayed where they were. So right. um, I went over there later on in the evening. Yeah, because they, they, they were they were dropped yeah. off by the, the driver, but they weren't cemented in yet. Yeah. Yeah. So we went and... Um, we started kind of, we went into the park, we started walking down the road and was just kind of going down where everything had um, taken place. And I remember um, I was looking down at, um, Tom was in front of me and I was looking down at his shoes and I'm like, Tom, your, your shoes are glowing. And he's like, what? <laughs> and he like looks down at his shoes and he's like, wow, this is weird. And I'm like, this is crazy. Your shoes are glowing. So we, we get down further and um, the side where the um, actual sighting of the UFO was, um, the fields were like, had a, had a glow to them too. Wow. On that the side. ground. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's freaky. Yeah. yeah. That is wild. And not, and not just like a moonlight, like a black light. I mean, it wasn't yeah, it was white like a light, like a exactly. flashlight. They wow. were glowing yeah. like when you're in a nightclub and it wasn't just my shoes. And then Sean got sick. She's like, mm -hmm. I don't feel good. You know, and oh. and then uh, yeah, I, I started feeling very, very um, dizzy. And then Paul like, thought he saw a bear. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't by any chance, uh, you know, radiation or anything, was it? You know, it's, I, it's weird because there's dead spots of long grass in there, right? Uh, and so, yeah. and, oh, wait, listen to this, ready? Because it's funny you mentioned that. Sometimes the corn grows in a ball, not like a stalk. Oh, you're kidding. Now, now check this out. How tall do you think the average corn grows? Well, I, I grew up with corn at my grandfather's farm, so maybe maybe I'd say six, seven feet, maybe a stalk. How, how, how about this? Is How big is it? 15? It's 15, 15 feet. 
<laughs> 15 feet. 15 and feet. This, yeah. yeah. And you can go, matter of fact, there's pictures of it. Now, again, remember I said this is not about me. The his, historical society, the historians in the area have mm-hmm. taken pictures and, and of this corn. And yeah. matter of fact, at one point, Lynn was there. You know, Lynn. Um, yeah. You know, um, yeah. this corn is 14 to 15 feet high. Yeah. And, and if you go a m- half a mile down the road, it's not, it's half that. But yeah, right where this took like place, you've feet, got like dead spots. Feet. You got dead spots of ground. You've got this weird glowing thing, and you've got corn that grows. Now, didn't he say it was seventeen? At some of it, maybe I'm right, wrong, but was it sixteen or seventeen at one point? Yeah, I think um, the one year it had got up to, um, I believe it was a total of seventeen feet. The, wow, the one seven. year, yeah. That's amazing. Feet it got up to. Yeah, yeah. There, and if you, there could if you be go a to the vortex there. Yeah, Which and if you go, if, dizzy. if you're interested and you can get on your computer or your listeners can, just go to ufomonumentpark.com and there's a picture of it. Yeah. It's on Ooh. the web page. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 It, That's I mean, pretty amazing. Great. What really baffles me is the corn that grows in, in a bowl. That, you know. Yeah. yeah. Not all of it, just some of it. You, you can't. <laughs> I was going to say, boy, if you could if you could market that, that would be something else. You know? Yeah, ball of corn. <laughs> Have a ball it's of corn. corn. <laughs> yeah. Real corn ball, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what a corn ball. There's a great marketing thing there, too. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, some of it uh, actually grows like a ball. I mean, that, again, I've got pictures yeah. of that, too. And by the way, there's also the orb thing that we saw as kids. They have It's been seen there, and I've got a picture of that. Um, which I could also send you. That was sent to me by the people who own the the thousand or sixteen hundred acres there, and they saw that. And if you go on BLT research and look at Sheffield uh, crop circle, now again, I'm not a someone who's you know I don't want to overstate anything. I don't know a thing about crop circles, but I can tell you that there was an orb there. It's filmed several pictures of it. It's only about a half a mile from the monument. And while it was there is when they noticed these weird formations in their corn. Wow. Now, um, a lot of people have investigated it. Again, I don't know what it is, but I can tell you that uh, there's – this is part of the reason why so many people have gotten behind this park because people who live around that monument – I say monument, but around that body of land – are mm-hmm. all on board with this. They see it. They've 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 seen it in the '60s. They've seen it in the '80s, and they've seen it, you know, in the last couple of years. Am I right, Sean, about that? I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. That's yeah. Amazing. I, I, I can only I can't, go, I can't, I can't only see this thing growing. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only see I, this I can't thing even, getting bigger. I mean, you know, it's really nice. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can't even go to the park without, like Tom was saying earlier, without people stopping and sharing you know sharing what they witnessed and Neat. and being so excited about about the advancements at the park and you know um i mean everybody has been so has been so amazing and um even when todd goes up there um he's the guy that that does all a lot of the maintenance and things like that there for for me and he you know whenever he's over there they all stop him and and thank him and you know, it's 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 been it's been awesome. It really has. You get these guys coming through the fields on their quads now, and they visit <laughs> yeah. the thing. Yeah, I mean, it's becoming really. Now, I guess you got an event there too on the twenty second. I think, right, Sean? When I Travis do. is going to be I there. Do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Travis Walton is going to be coming there on the twenty second of October. Um, it will be um, since he sponsored the park. Um, he's going to be in the area for um, Paraween. So he is going to, um, he wanted to see the, um, the bench that he sponsored because he hasn't had a chance to go to the park. So he agreed to go to the park and do a meet and greet. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, media attention behind it and stuff. So we're, we're excited for that. I think it's going to be a really great turnout. We've had a lot of people saying, I will be there. So um, we're really looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a great time. And the radio station, this is kind of cool, you, just a little to add to that. Mm-hmm. WSBS Radio um, actually wrote a letter, God, I don't know, 10 years ago, that was hanging in the Roswell Museum. I don't know if you know that or not. But mm, no, the, no. The radio station had broadcast the event or the sighting in 1969 um, has had a letter in the Roswell Museum for a long time. Now, it wasn't – I misspoke. It wasn't in the museum. It was in the research library. Um, yeah. That was handled by Karen, and so 
WSBS has kind of obviously gotten behind this too because their letter has been hang, you know displayed in a in, it was in a walkway actually in the uh, in in the research library mm. uh, in Roswell. But anyway, so they're excited to have Travis in the area. So now Travis is actually going to go on WSBS radio that actually broadcast this event in 1969 in the park that he's sponsoring now that is affiliated now with the radio station. So it, mm-hmm. like you said, it is kind of growing in the way that there's a weird web to it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you've, it just seems to get its own legs. I mean, uh, I mm-hmm. have no control. A lot of people are like, Oh, you know, they don't realize that I live a thousand miles away from this. Friggin park. <laughs> I, right. I, I'm nowhere near the friggin' park. I wish I did because I'd be there all the time. I'd be like, Hey man, you know, how's it going? <laughs> and it kind of <laughs> out there shakes. Yeah. You're, you're like, down, you're down in FLA, right? I live outside Atlanta. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I'm going back. I'm moving back to St. Augustine, Florida in this next year. But, um, yeah, I, I live, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I actually live in, in Tennessee, believe it or not, of all places. Um, Bible Belt. Um, one of but, one uh, of my favorite states. I grew up there in the summers. Yeah. Where Where were you? Uh, I Tennessee used to be my summer home. Uh, uh, Camden, Tennessee, actually. Where's that? It's um eighty eighty five miles due west of Nashville. Okay. Well, we. I'm, I live. You know. I you know Farragut, Tennessee. Farragut, um, Admiral Farragut. That's, I'm you know, not U- sure. UT? You know U- UT? Yeah, yeah. I live um, 10 miles from UT. Oh, okay, okay. Except I'm not big on orange, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> More of a Florida fan, but um, but it makes for interesting conversation. But um, yeah, so I'm moving back to Florida, and um, I'll be up uh, – I guess we'll all be up in New England. I'm going to be at the park too on the 22nd. Mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, I want to say this too, but, but I know it's getting late. Um but um, I want to thank you for your intro because um, – and if I may, I want to express something and that is very important to me. Sure, sure. I have had uh, a lot of uh, – I don't want to say pressure, but I've had um, – and Sean knows this. I've had a long talk with her mm-hmm. about it. Um, when this was getting inducted in state, trust me when I say I had a slew of emails, okay? What – the town in the state was very concerned about was that if they were to vote on this thing and it was to go through that I could not use certain terminology. I could not say certain things. I could not use t- what they considered to be tabloid references. Mm. I could tell people what happened. I could uh, uh, you know, be specific in that. They're not going to tell me I can't talk about it, but I can't use certain references. I can't use right. certain terminology because – what they were, it could cost them their jobs, and ultimately, I don't know if your listeners or you know this, but it did cost Debbie Aberman her job. Oh, um, she ended up getting, you know, forced out because of it, because of the way things get spun or turned around. Mm-hmm. Now, I got a call from the chief of police, Eric Munson, not that long ago, to do a, a joint article with an art, a paper called Mass Live, if you're familiar with that, um, because when these shows that I do, or radio, or what have you. Um, you know, it makes it look like the town uh, in, um, inducted an abduction case, and mm-hmm. and the town itself uh, will tell you no, they didn't. They inducted a case that involves a UFO sighting and a and a visitation, if you will, mm-hmm. but they have to keep it palatable. Because if this municipality doesn't keep it palatable and historians don't keep it has, you know, palatable, then it could get taken out of history because of the of the um, concerns that they would have about mm-hmm. you know what they did. So I have got to stay to the verbiage on the induction letters. Now I've never really expressed that before, but it's true. I have I can't vary. From the wording on the citation, uh, the two citations from the governor's office or Charles Baker or the lieutenant governor and or the local historical society or the letter from the historical society signed by the judge. I can't vary from any one of those four letters. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, I agree to that, and I think anybody would because I'm trying to take something – You know, my experience is no different than 
Julia's or anyone else's out there listening, let's face it. We all have had weird things happen. We're all part of the same camp, okay? But for me to make a difference, I can't do it being reckless. I can I can only make a difference for – not just me. This isn't about our case. This is a community thing. I cannot do anything for anyone else you know, if I don't – if I'm not careful. Right. Because right now, mm-hmm. the case has gotten further than anyone else's, and it's paving the way for the Travis Waltons. It's paving the way for, you know, Kathleen Martin. It's paving the way for, you know, blood so It's paving the way for a lot of people. Right. You right. know, even McMinnville. Um, yeah, we're all connected. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So for me, right now, I am making some strides here, and I'm proud of that. Now, do I have, you know, a governor on me? Yeah, I guess I do. But at the same time, at the end of the day. I will have been able to take something very unique, very different, very personal, and have done something good with it for not just myself, but a lot of people. Yeah. And I don't think people realize that. So when they bring me on and they, you know, say Tom read this or Tom read that, when it's not true, doesn't just hurt me; it hurts them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I get so upset when I go on the radio and my bio is all screwed up, saying things that aren't true, because mm-hmm. if you know the the historical society is on my Facebook. You know, there's a lot yeah. of people from Sheffield yeah, and Ray Barrington right. and the police department in the town of Sheffield that watch my Facebook post. They're you know they're on my Twitter accounts. So, you know, it's very important to me that you know that I, you know that that there's a, a mutual respect here, and I want to thank you for that. Oh wow! Because well, recently, my goodness, that hasn't been the case. And that's why mm-hmm. last year I, did, I didn't do a lot of radio anymore because I was so close. When Debbie Oberman got fired, I mm. was so close to getting this pulled out of the, pulled out of, you know, the, uh, wow. the induction because like when they interviewed, just to give you an example, when the Historical Society – I don't know if you know this. I was on the front page of the cover the Boston Globe. Did you know that? No. Yeah, my face was on the uh, – yeah. I was on the cover of the Boston Globe for the first – it was said uh, – UFO case makes Hall of History. Yep, there was my face right there. When I had hair, actually, to use that old picture. But, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know. But, but at the same time, it was on the cover of the Washington Times. It was covered live by ABC News New York. Uh, it made uh, again the cover of the Boston Globe. It was also um, it was actually picked up uh, in uh, California when uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area paper. Um, so anyway, when it happened, when that article was being written by um, Billy Baker, actually, of the Boston Globe, um, they promised the uh, historical society that they would not use certain terminology. And, of course, they did. Not three, not four, not about five times. Oh, boy. And yeah. it cost her her job. Unbelievable. So, but, you know, understand, I guess you've got, you know, um, you've got government, you've got state, you've got historians – you know, uh, you, you know, uh, and I, and I've got a producer who needs us to go to, to a break. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I just want to share <laughs> that's okay. that with you because nobody that's okay. understands I just, that part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got to get that in so that we can go forward. Um, you're, you're listening to the Starborn Connection right here on KGRA, your connection to the multiverse. We'll see you on the other side. Hi folks, let's wind the clocks back 60 years. Food was different. Food provided health and nutrition, and using supplements was minimal. Unfortunately, now we have chemicals, GMOs, herbicides, and pesticides that can be quite lethal in the name of our food supply, and of course the ever-loving dollar. Supplementing our diets can be very important to stay healthy. Cleansing from daily intruders to the body might be critical. Live strong and take charge. Log on to GetTheTea.com. Our herbal tea is a great way to cleanse from intruders. Our supplements is a great way to maintain and improve your health. When your health is not up to par, go to GetTheTea.com. No GMOs, no fillers, and organic. And very helpful in keeping you at the top of your game. Life is too short to feel, uh, you know what I mean. Stay in the game, at the top of your game, with GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Again, GetTheTea.com. Hi, it's AJ with Vibes Mind, Body, Spirit. The Vibes Tribe seeks to assist you in creating and maintaining an uplifting and balanced state of being in your personal space. 
Palo Santo is a mystical tree that grows on the coast of South America. Palo is loved by many for its energetic cleansing and healing properties and is also popularized for its heavenly presence in keeping your energy grounded and clear. Burning Palo provides an uplifting scent to raise your vibration and is also beneficial for relieving stress, anxiety, depression, and emotional pain. Palo Santo is also known for relieving symptoms of the common cold, headaches, and asthma. We offer Palo Santo in resin, powder, or by the stick. Go to OnlineVibes.com for all of your vibration elevation needs and receive a free stick of Palo Santo with any online purchase over $25. Shop OnlineVibes.com, that's OnlineVibes.com, and get your vibes on today. It's Thursday night and you're grabbing drinks with some friends. Start it off with a pitcher for the table, which quickly becomes two. There's pool. And there's the photo booth. All right, everybody squeeze in. Say cheese. Followed naturally by an order of wings. And another. Can we get some extra ranch sauce? Then there's the ceremonial nightcap. So what are we doing this weekend? And lastly, it's back to the car, which, if you're buzzed... could be the most expensive night of your life. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving, because buzz driving is drunk driving. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Your alternative talk radio contact, the planet, KGRARadio.com. Welcome back to the last part of our show. We're at 11.32, I believe, somewhere around there. At least that's what my clock says. And uh, right now I'm going to turn it over to my co-host who um, uh, wants to do a little bit of uh, talking about, um, I guess, uh, the Las Vegas incident, right? Well, I'm going to talk about the my interpretation of Ali. Okay. What Ali oh, said. okay, right, right. Uh, Ali I'm, going to tr- I'm going to try to talk as fast as possible, <laughs> and then I'm going to. I wrote something uh, that came from Spirit. When I when I talk about Spirit, it's it's what I feel. Well, that's okay. I don't want you to rush. Okay, we okay. have next okay. about the event. Uh, yeah. what's the energetics of what's really going on. So, all right, let me let me get right to the interpretation of Ali. What I was picking up. The first thing he talked about was, I think, energy. The energy of the earth is weak, so his ship is weak. I, I got two interpretations of that. He, the ship is used, there's, there's um, I think, an energy that goes around the earth, uh, an energy field that their ship uses to fuel it. Oh, right. And when right. that's weak, the ship's, but I also felt that when, Ali is so connected emotionally with planet with the people of Earth. So when the Earth is suffering emotionally, not, not with the people of Earth, just that one person. I know, but yeah. he can still feel the energy. Of, oh yeah, absolutely. Of Earth. Okay, I'm getting to that. The relationship between them. That's the last part. Um, so the second part, I think. Okay, uh, let me see if I remember because it was okay. The governments. Uh, the European government and the U.S. government not being strong anymore, losing their strength. Mm-hmm. That's actually happened. It's been happening since World War II. They are losing their strength. Uh, actually, what, he didn't say this, but I do have sources that are telling me China is going to be the new uh, big power. It's uh, And the new, uh, when the ascension really happens, when the new... Uh, paradigm shifts start happening. China is going to be the one that brings on the financial change and and, and everything. Um, so he was talking about um, the ascension process, and he was. Ta- I was waiting for him. I was like, when's he going to start talking about that? So they're picking up on the the spiritual awakening of the human race, and they're becoming awake and aware. I mean, we're becoming awake and aware of. Um, the you know the matrix the right. the government system how things have been in the money system education how that kind of works the religious system all these systems 
are actually false and they're working against us. They're enslaving us. So we're becoming awake and aware to that by but that first we're going through our own spiritual revolution, which means, you know, everybody's starting to transmute their emotions, their negative stuff, and they're integrating every, all their aspects together. So they're growing spiritually. So that affects the greater society because then you have people that are, you know, living in unconditional love that are working in these institutions. They start to change so the young people that are being born now are already born with all these abilities. So when they start moving into government, you know, everything's going to start to change. Mm -hmm. So he didn't say all that, but what, what he's saying is he is aware that this is happening. Right. So the next thing he talks about um, are the underground bases. We do know, I've had from several sources, you know, there are a lot of reptilian bases underneath as well as other races, good and bad. Uh, we have been the the some of the ET races, and I believe some of it is our government that is the White Hats that are working together, the good guys, uh, have destroyed a lot of reptilian bases, or they were doing bombings underneath. So the Rock, you know, I'm sure everything is. So I imagine the ones that are underground, um, they're a little worried about the structures because they're getting ready to crumble. Um, because they're trying to get rid of all the reptilian stuff and all, you know, all the stuff. Uh, there are good bases, but uh, most of the, I, I mean, I know there's one in Telus. I know there's one in um, e where he said he ranches in Mount Adams. Uh, there's a lot of bases. Nobody can get to them. I mean, they're pretty fortified, but they're the Palladians and the Lumerians, and so they're more positive. So anyway, uh, I think the last thing he talked about was, um, so he knows about the spiritual awakening, um, and the governments are getting ready to crumble. So the whole system's getting ready to revamp. Um, and then he talks about the relationship with Iona. He's Iona's twin flame. They're aspects of each other. And um, he, when, when he was talking, my heart, ex like, just, he loves her. He loves her. And I'm not talking necessarily romantic. I'm talking, I can't even describe it. Well, apparently, apparently they've been together for uh, more than one lifetime. Well, they've had romantic relationships, but this type of love that he has for her is just, it's a godly love, a family love, but it's everything. I mean, I, I have relationships where I've had romantic past lives with people, but I also have current lives where we're totally different. And I have all those emotions all at once for those people. I, mm -hmm. I haven't gotten the past. Sometimes they were my father. Sometimes they, we were lovers in the same person. And I'm not married to that person now, but I still have all those emotions but but it's not necessarily just romantic. It's like everything. It's more godly. It's more. Oh God! It's just there's no English words to describe it. Um, I guess the biblical description is the best, where it talks about uh, agape love, or you know, it, it's 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 just a connection, and it's an unconditional love, a connection. It's 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 as if the other person is you. You know, you're you're just so connected. So anyway, he has this love for her. So he's warning against the computers. It's not just about the people that are hacking. It's about the trolls. And it really hurts him terribly when people attack Iona's truth, when people attack both, both sisters, you know, basically. But she's the one that's pretty much out there. Um, it really hurts him when people... Uh, uh, he's telling everybody she's just translating the message. That's all she's doing. So don't bother her. Don't hurt her. Don't be trolls. You know, he doesn't use those words. But, right. Um, he's like very upset and very angry and very hurtful and very protective of her. So any negativity that people have where they don't believe the story or they're just attacking verbally, he's saying she's just the messenger. Leave her alone. Right. So there's a lot of love, a lot of love there and protection. I mean, they're totally protected. So basically he's saying, you know, we, we watch them 24 hours. They're, they're protected by us, even though all these groups are after them. And we have to be very careful what we put on the computer. I think personally, 
um, because people are looking. So basically that, that was in a nutshell very quickly, but I'm so happy that he's starting to talk about people becoming awake and aware in the ascension process. And things are beginning to change. So that means, of course, if things are beginning to change, the governments have to lose their power. And then the, the power actually is the people. And, and, there, and everybody changing all the different institutions because it's, it's now about cooperation and unconditional love. It's not about uh, competition anymore and selfishness which and, and you know fear being in fear so that's my interpretation and that leads me into the event that we just had uh, oh and he also talked about the media which i'm going to go into right now so he talked about the media um you know not being trustworthy and and being you know spreading the fear which is part of the old system so um so anyway um my comment about Vegas. Um, I don't really watch the news very much, but now I'm starting to watch it a little more because I think I need to be informed about all the the information that's coming in so I can, you know, get an idea. Um, so when I first heard of the shooting, I immediately thought this was a false flag. It is not that it did not really happen. It certainly did, and people were killed. I turned on the news, and I saw the picture of the gunman. When I heard his biography, it did not make any sense. I immediately thought he is either a Manturian candidate or some sort of patsy, like um, like uh, in the Kennedy case, Oswald. I later found out he did purchase all the guns, he was wealthy, retired, and living a, quote, good life. However, it did look like this was being planned because he went to the different gun shops and he seemed to have planned it for some time. So I have to assume that something was making him do this. We talked earlier in the show about sonic beams that were affecting the diplomats in Cuba. We did a few shows back on that. Mm -hmm. It could have something to do with that. Um Kind of the sonic beams getting you to do things you don't want to do or getting you sick or whatever, you know, like a, it's still a Manchurian candidate type of thing. So I, um, now I will explain what I intuitively thought about the energy involved in the event. After the eclipse, the energy was such that so many people are now becoming awake and aware. The veil is being lifted. Thy vibrations are much higher all over the earth as more people become awake. So what does the cabal or the archons or Illuminati do to prevent the awakening? They create fear and panic. Fear is not the opposite of courage. Courage is acting on something even though you still have fear. Love is the opposite of fear. If you love someone that is different than you, even though you do not understand their culture, you will not want to harm them. You are not afraid of them. You simply love them as they are. So the powers that be that are currently enslaving humanity by the money system and other systems are fighting back because they know their time is up. They're losing. We are going to ascend into fifth dimensional consciousness anyway because this is the choice of humanity now. I have heard from many psychic friends that an event was going to happen in September, a false flag. Only one person got it right who stated in October there would be a false flag. He also stated that if this event did not happen, it actually would prolong humanity's awakening process. So sometimes a horrible event has to happen to wake us up, just like many of us have a marriage breakup or illness or accident. And then we reevaluate our lives and our lives become so much more fulfilling. By the way, Simon Parks of the United Kingdom was the only one that got it, the date right. However, we are all thinking that it was going to happen in New York. We didn't think it would be Vegas. I also heard from a woman I listened to that channels the Arcturians. Uh, she channels the Arcturians, and her name is Suzanne Lai. They call her Suzio. The media is used to enforce the fear. It gets its ratings and advertising money from perpetually fearful events. The media does not report on the many fantastic, incredible, good situations that are currently happening in the world. There are ascended masters now walking mm. among us, performing many miracles, healing, and upgrading of humanity every day. 
be an observer of what is going on, but do not get cut up in it. I do not watch the news to get an idea of what they are dishing out, so I am aware, but I watch it very limitedly. So I do watch it to get pieces of it, but I don't watch it all day long. I used I used to watch it uh, when I was cleaning my house all day long, and I don't do that anymore because it really it, it gives you a fear based kind of vibration. So I want my vibrations high. So I listen to music or I listen to radio shows for other light workers that are talking about ascension process. So we do need to be aware of what's going on, but to continue to meditate and go within. Send love energies from the heart to these places that are affected by these tragedies. The only way to combat the fear and the lowering of vibration is for you individually keeping a higher vibration no matter what happens outside. The hurricane damages, the shootings. Give your money to support your prayers and your offerings. In your daily life, play uplifting music. Do things that give you joy. Keep learning and expanding. And be good and kind to everyone you meet. Spread unconditional love wherever you go. That includes loving the people that the most are the most ignorant or you don't agree with. We all are going through our own awakening at different times and different levels. Again, how to combat all the negative events? Spread unconditional love. Keep your vibration high. Namaste. I love you all. So that was my comment. On. So, what do you guys think? Well, I, I, I it, was, it was awesome. <laughs> it was awesome. I liked it. I just uh, accidentally ripped my headphones off and threw them across the room. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> ah, geez, that was weird. All right, anyway, no, I think I think you're you know hitting close to home on some of that stuff. Uh, you know, to have a relationship. Uh, of 23 years or 24 years with these uh, two ladies um, is pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, we haven't even begun to uh, scratch the surface of all the information that they've had. They've held back everything for years and years. So uh, I don't know. They might be thinking that it's time to get this stuff out there. But, um, but what I was, um, you know, saying in this whole piece, though, about Las Vegas was that these false flags happen because the archons and the negative entities are, quote, Illuminati, whatever you want to call them. They, and ne- the negative ETs, they feed on negative emotions and negative fear. That's why, you know, the wars are constantly going on. And Right. So whenever there's a high vibration... Or something wonderful. There's always seems to be an event to pull everybody down. Mm. So we have to be mindful of that on the spiritual realm. The other level is the finances. You know, the the uh, the government, the uh, black right. government is. You know, they want to perpetuate the indu- the military industrial complex wants the money from all these things because they always finance both both sides. But I don't want my son to fight for any of mm-hmm. those because it's not. You know. So, well, you know, Tom, Tom, Sean, any opinions about that? I just wish more people would awaken sooner. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, tell me that. You know, they I are. really do. I, 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 ju- I was just having this conversation today with a few people, and I, I really like. I don't. Everything has changed in this world so much, and there's so much hatred in the world, and Polarity. so much. Yeah so many things that are going on that is just so negative. And, you know, I, I know me personally, I try to live my life in a positive way and I try to treat others as I would want them to treat me, you know, and I think more people just really need to think about that and, you know, start, you know, living their life in a positive way rather than focusing on all all this negativity that's going on because it, if we do focus on more positive, it's definitely going to make the world a better place. It's not a only that. That's a, that's a big deal, you know, your vibration, mm-hmm. keeping that up and making yeah. other people happy no matter how small. But it's the polarity. Like, notice mm-hmm. how, I mean, I'm 56 years old, so I've seen, like, I could have 
friends and have dinner with Republicans and Democrats and people mm-hmm. may have differences of opinion, but th- now you can't even talk, you can't live in the same state. No, you, can't. you can't. So the, the thing that's going on now is the energy is so, the polarity is so intense because in order for people, in order for us to have heaven on earth, in order for us to have our, you know, all be in fifth dimensional consciousness, that we have to be in unity with one another. That's where unconditional love comes in. So when the polarity has to happen for us to realize what we don't want, and then eventually it's going to eventually come together. We're going to have a whole new political system. We're getting rid of all that. It's it, There's going to be a whole new thing that's going to benefit everybody. It's going to take some time. We're in the beginnings of it. But this has to happen, this craziness and chaos mm-hmm. has to happen in order for the system to break down and for us to build it up again. So that's... Yeah. You know, so it's a good thing. I mean, it's horrible to go through it, but the ki- the new kids coming in, the the indigo children, they're amazing. They 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 have so much compassion. And imagine as all the CEOs of all the world and all the political leaders having compassion and unconditional love. How the systems would change. You know. Oh, I know. It's, it's happening. You know, people are there's kids that are in their twenties now. They're getting ready to go in organizations and they're just already there i mean they're just Mm -hmm. it's beautiful to see so that's my take well it was a good one (laughs) yeah (laughs) and uh i what i'll do is i'll i'll see if i can finish that uh uh, september 10th transmission this week there's so much to it and and believe me i i uh agonize over this stuff because uh, I've been. It's kind of been alluded that uh, everybody's kind of getting it wrong uh, uh, yeah, or misinterpreting yeah. it. But yeah. you know, how how else how else can you do it? I mean, who can understand really well, the, I just, e- the essence of the message? Yeah, I just did it by spirit, what I right. intuitively felt. But that's you know, that's my well, take. Well, anyway, um, Tom, are we going to yeah. do this again next week for the first hour? Get together again, and we'll uh, we'll deal with your story, and uh, Sean can come <laughs> along. And the... yeah, I'd love to. Because I, I think it's important to get the story out, and I think it's also important that people understand the the, the proper, you know, way they should look at the at at the park, the monument, and what your role is in that so that maybe in the future these radio hosts won't get it all screwy yeah it's not everybody it's just a a few but uh i certainly appreciate you know uh the intro today and and the, and the way you stuck to uh what was important hey by the way um how far are you from from salem mass are you uh would you, would you uh, be able to go to Parawine or no i'm i'm uh, uh let me see i guess as, 20 miles southeast of Philly on the uh, Delaware border. Oh, you're a ways away then. Because I was going to say, anybody on your show that wants to go, I mean, I could do something where they get 20% off or $10 on their ticket for listening tonight or anything that you think mm-hmm. might mm-hmm. might be nice to do. Uh, you know, it's going to be great. We've got uh, we've got Paramount Pictures there. We've got mm-hmm. uh, Lionsgate Films. They're going to be uh, – we're showing the, the uh, new uh, – uh, Blair Witch film, Blair Witch oh, Legacy. Really? Wow. Yeah, we've got yeah, and Saw, the new Saw, Jigsaw. We've got. Um, I can't the, watch that stuff. It's yeah, they're exciting. gonna be there, and Travis is gonna be there. Mike Bars, Ancient Aliens is gonna be there. Oh, you know, Sean's gonna be there. That uh, I would like yeah. to see. Yeah. We've got the the UFO Museum is gonna be uh, skyping in. Nick Redfern, uh, Richard Dolan's gonna be skyping in. We've got a lot of you know, oh, Julio yeah. from The Walking Dead. It's going to be huge. Yeah, and, all of our and, friends, and we can't be there. <laughs> well, you, you you kind of can. I mean, I could actually. I was thinking maybe if you want to broadcast from there or something, but um, just hmm. you know, uh, one you know, and yeah. again, if anyone listening to your station, I can tell you what, I've got a coupon code in or in the Paraween has a coupon code called Paraween Rocks. If you type in Paraween Rocks when you order a ticket, you'll save twenty percent. Hey, that's pretty cool. damn good. That's yeah, it's ten dollars. It's forty nine dollar ticket. You get it for thirty nine bucks. Yeah, it's Not already bad. plugged in there. Yeah, it's already there. I uh, just want to let you you guys uh, know about it. If you want to go, um, I'm sure Sean or whoever will take you, get your tickets. You know, cover your you know from for going. Julia, you're welcome. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's at least they can do. It. Hey, listeners, do it. Go this yeah. year. Get Thank your you tickets. So 
Man, oh man, that's great. That really October is. October twenty first. Yeah. So October twenty uh, first. I was going to be all day. Oh, yeah. by the way, too, we opened up the entire vendor area, which is free. Free. Mm-hmm. It's right downtown wow. Salem. It got twenty, forty, fifty thousand people there on a Saturday. Vendor area is open, free to public. Cool. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, it's going to be awesome. And then we're going to be at the park on the twenty second, which you know, again, if you guys yeah. can make it. Uh, also, eye candy from Paranormal Laughter Party is going to be there on the twenty second. Wow! And Peter yeah. Robbins might be too on at the park. Yeah. Ah, uh, good old Peter. I haven't seen him for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. He's had a tough year, I think, but wish him the best. Yeah. All right, so Joe, about, hey Julia, real quick about your thing. You know, I was thinking about it. Um, you know what I find a little odd is that all these people today, they're, like you said, you can't be a Democrat and be with a Republican. People are getting really, really antsy about that. I mean, it's really, there's a lot yeah. of tension, right? Awful. Right. Yeah. Well, if there's so much love in this world. Why would you let the media exactly. get you that worked up? The media caused it too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, get you so angry at your own neighbor or friend. Exactly. I've seen it so many. I didn't want to say anything because it's kind of, I don't like to say negative things, but it's true. If, you know, we go to a party or somebody has a couple of drinks and says something. Next thing you know, they're arguing over something. And I'm like, yeah, what are you arguing over? You guys are friends. Yeah, you know, yeah. this mm-hmm. was all fueled by, you know, MSNBC, MSNBC and Brother, CNN and yeah. the rest of it, you know, Us, just yeah. tearing our country apart. And it's tearing our friends and fr- relationships yeah. apart. And it's, it's, it's the really, verbiage. It's the verbiage. It'll change. That they use, it's changing. You know? It'll yeah. change. It's too bad. But hey, listen, guys, thanks for having me. I know you got to get off. Um, Sean, thanks for being part of it. And yes, I'll- please. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. So next uh, Saturday. You're so welcome. Ne- next Saturday, uh, Tom and Sean will bring you in for the first hour, and, and we'll wrap things up there. And then uh, second hour, I think uh, Julie and I have some stuff we want to deal with. So, oh, so we only uh, get an hour now? You want, well, if you want them both, I'll give them to you. you know, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Whatever works, guys. I appreciate it. Okay, so it's Paroween Rocks, right? Yeah, that's the Paroween okay. Rocks. Paroween Rocks, people. Get your tickets. Yep. Paroween.com. Take it easy, guys. Thanks so much. Hey, no problem all at all. Right, God bless everyone. Thank you. Julia, Bill, thanks for all you do. And uh, people out there around the world, across the universe, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>